anyway, at the end of the day, when you when you do analyses like this, you you know you and this is this is partially using your groundwater flow model as well, but you you, you know you, you wind up estimating your you know I said 120 with the groundwater flow model, we ended up with 160 millimeters a year. We we know what's coming out in the streams, we know what's moving to Lake Simcoe, and you start to to understand your your watershed on a, on a broader basis. Um, and then just some some graphs again. Rick uh, put these together. Working, he's working with the the Credit Toronto and, and Central Lake Ontario committee. <clears throat> but if you look at if you look at some of the watersheds, you can see that you know here's our base flow measurement from the from the from the stream flow gauge. Here's our <coughs> PRMS in this case, our groundwater infiltration. So that's how much recharge we think is going in, and then the discharge. So you can compare the recharge and the discharge. So our groundwater flow models give us an estimation of what's moving out from the groundwater system to the stream across the whole catchment. So you can start to compare these numbers and see how, how well they match up. And in cases, say the Oshawa Creek, where you have your stream flow gauge is measuring a much more, a much higher base flow or groundwater flow component to the stream than what we're estimating is going in from our PRMS model. So, so there might be something here that water is moving into Oshawa Creek from, from other watersheds. You know, you can start, again, so it's just taking the data, plotting it up, and then thinking. I mean, I, I think that's, that's one of the things that, that seems to be lacking a lot of places. It's just, just people having the time, and, it, and it's really a matter of time, because there's, there's so many things happening so quickly that people haven't got the time to sit down and really think about the data and what it's telling them. And, and collecting data too is another big issue. I don't think you have any slides on that. And I was, as I was driving here, I said I got, I got to remember to to say stuff about um, about collecting data. There's a there's a great paper um, from a fellow who, uh, Environment Canada. I think he he he's wrote a paper that someone put across my desk late last year that talked about this. How how this generation of, of hydrologists, hydrogeologists, is the last generation that's collecting data. And, and now it's turning out that you know we're we're taking model output and using it to feed model inputs, and it's a just a really clever paper, and, he, and it has an analogy to hamburgers and no meat and so on. But it's uh, if, you, if you want it, I could I could you know, could follow up with me, and I could I could flip it to you in the next slide. Just a similar stuff in the Toronto Toronto um, uh, watersheds and, and the same kind of information, so you can start to see, you know, where where your where your models might be, need more tweaking to to better understand the system, or whether you you have groundwater moving across watershed divides and so on. So the really really kind of simple techniques to try and better understand your system. <coughs> yeah, yeah uh, I'm not I'm really trying to understand the model with this, but <coughs> did you ever take the next step to say, well, if my if my recharge is is happening? And, and, it, and it's, it's moving fast down the stream and, and you lose the recharge fairly quickly. Do you ever get to the point where I say, well, if I plant trees there, what, what effect would that have on maintaining that recharge as opposed to let, let, let it dissipate downstream? Mm. Or another thing that you might consider is evaporation. Like how would evaporation come in to skim your models? Yeah, I think I think I mean I think we're we're gonna be moving in that direction. I mean there's a whole bunch of things I could say. I guess um uh, you know, with this, with this PRMS kind of, kind of modeling, mm -hmm. that ability is now there, and that's that's probably one of the advantages to moving to these more sophisticated models. If we if we truly understand how to turn the knobs yeah. and the well, buttons, once right, you've got but, tweaks done and you don't got good data, we we only have a limited amount of time with climate change adaptation to climate yeah. change, etc. Yeah. 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 To understand where the water is disappearing. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some there's some. Yeah. So, a lack of trees is flushing. You know, we're going to probably get some weather flushes. Yeah. Process, you know. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, actually that. I mean, we're in this, in this project that we're just starting. It's interesting. We're, we want to look at that. Uh, we've got Trent yeah. University involved. So that's in this your project. objective then is, is to is to, is to fix kind of, yeah, kind of take a look at at uh, different um, forested systems. So they're they're putting in uh, climate stations in a in a coniferous forest, a deciduous forest, and in a in a uh, just a farm field. And, and trying to take a look at the differences in, in 
because there, there's an argument that trees actually, you know, do trees increase your, your groundwater recharge or decrease it? Do they suck the water up or, or do they yeah. promote more water? And, and Ireland, there's a big paper a few years in Ireland that they were looking at reforesting all of Ireland. And, you know, a lot of people got up in Ireland saying, holy smokes, you know, that our water supplies are going to dry up, the trees are going to take yeah. all the water. So, yeah. so it's, a, it's, still, it's still actually an interesting yeah. area. I mean, in yeah. Canada, we've got the snow melt or the snow pack, and then you know, there's an argument that forested areas keep a better, bigger, thicker snow pack, so therefore more water goes down as a result of snow, which is different than Ireland. So Jim Buttle at, at Trent University has explored this, and, and there's some data, there's, a, there's some neat papers from uh, forestry journal someone showed me a few years ago on the, the potholes of Durham, Durham Forest, and when they, when they cut down the Ganarasca Forest and regrew it, there's some data that, that uh, I can't remember now which way it points. But anyway, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question and one that yeah, definitely needs to be explored more. Yeah. Just got to be some more about it. Um, when you were talking about data or monitoring, the importance of monitoring, yeah. is there any standardized protocol or anything that as um, citizens interested in groundwater and our watershed protections, any um, standardized protocol that could be pointed to if, if it's um, something we wanted to pursue? Well, measuring stream flows, I mean, Les Stanfield, I don't know if you've been involved with the, with any of his work, but uh, and the, the Check Your Watershed Day. Yeah. yeah, so they, I mean, the MNR through Les Stanfield, they developed a, what's he called it, stream, stream assessment protocol or something. So he has, he has a, quite a detailed protocol that <coughs> talks about a whole number of things. I think even from benthic sampling to stream flow measurement to, so that's, that's probably the, the best you know, the, the best reference document on it in terms of for citizen groups to look at. So. And, and just to follow up, is there any relationship between, um, uh, uh, so in a well-based community, where you're working on wells, private wells and things like that, and then as individuals, if I'm having, um, is my well an indicator for the groundwater, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. As my yeah, well yeah, water yeah, is yeah, disappearing, yeah. does that mean my groundwater is being impacted as well? You're drinking too. <laughs> okay, if I'm drinking yeah. less than I used to, but is, that, is there any, like, is, is a well yeah, a canary yeah, in a yeah. coal mine, kind of? Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, yeah, the, the, if, you, if you monitor water levels in your well, I mean, they're, you know, as long as you knock out the bad ones when, you know, when, after the pump has just been on, you know, because, I mean, you got to be measuring, the best time to measure is first thing in the morning before, you know, you flush the toilet for the first time or whatever, right? So, so after, after the evening, when, when it's, Probably at its you know static equilibrium. Um, so that's yeah, but measuring yeah, measuring measuring stream or water levels in wells for sure that's is a good. great data yeah. source. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just put a slide in here on modeling, just so I mean I'm not going to talk more, any more about modeling. I you know facetiously call it modeling black box, but a lot of a lot of thinking, a lot of work goes into into developing these groundwater flow models, you know, the pumping rates, stream flows, all the streams are in the, in the model and linked to the different layers in the geology, you know, recharge rates, and, and then a lot of geology, in our case, we've got a lot of work done for us by the Geological Survey of Canada through the 1990s that we've taken and incorporated into our, 